Welcome to House for Arts. I'm very excited to speak with you today. Thank you. I'm just excited to be here. I love the program. Well, that's great to hear that we have a wonderful fan because I, I understand that you do uh, research and talk a lot about censorship and free speech. And I'm just curi curious to know, uh, tell me a bit about your background. How did you initially become interested in this topic? It's uh, kind of a silly little story, but it had a wonderful ending. Uh, I started doing my graduate work and like all good PhD students, first year students, I'm casting about for a dissertation topic. You know, what, am I, what do I want to research? And I'm standing in the hallway one day and one of my favorite professors is out there and he says, you know, I have just come back from the New York State Archives and for the umpteenth time I've taken a public history class down there and for the umpteenth time I've listened to the archivist say, we have the world's largest collection of film scripts. We have the world's largest collection of information about movie censorship in the United States right here and no one has used it for public policy research. He said people have used it for, you know, because when Hollywood makes a movie, they throw the script away. So they have the scripts, they'll come back and look for the scripts, or people have used it for cultural research, but no one used it for public policy research. Mm. So my antenna went up and I thought, oh, okay, I'll go down there. You saw an open opportunity, an Abs open window. Absolutely, and, and like most Americans, I had no idea that New York State and six other states had censored movies legally in the early part of the 20th century and up until the 1960s, I had no idea. So I wanted to go down and find out who the censors were. Who were these people? And the finding aid said that there were records on the censors. So I went down there, mm -mm. the files were blank. There was nothing there. They had culled the records before they sent it over to the archives. So then in good graduate student fashion, I start looking at, okay, what are the biggest, fattest files? Because mo every movie has its own file. And the ones that aren't problematic, it's a really skinny little file. Mm -hmm. It's the application, it's the script, and it's the license. And then I thought, well, that's boring. What, well, what are what, the fat files? Oh, then? the fat files, that's the, that's the interesting thing. Those are the people who had a problem and who refused to accept the determination of the censors. Those are the people who challenged the censors and said, no, you can't do this to my movie. And the really fat files were the ones that had gone to court to question what the censors had done to their movies. And then I had it. And then you had it. And I understand yeah. that you made a book, I'm assuming out of this research, a book about the film industry and censorship in the United States. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, the book is called Fre Freedom of the Screen and it was, about half of it was that dissertation. And the other half is, uh, I talk about the Hayes Code. Now a lot of people know about the Hayes Code. This is the office that the Motion Picture Association created to self-censor to make sure that they would not run afoul of pressure groups who would boycott their movies, make sure they didn't run afoul of these state censors who I was studying. And so a lot of people know about that. So this book is a combination of the Hayes office and that self-censorship and then the governmental censors as well. What I found out was that before World War II, what they were mostly arguing was, you're wrong about my film. After World War II, we get a lot of cultural changes, and that's when people started arguing, you're wrong about censoring, period. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be censoring these films at all. And that's when we get the bigger cases, and that's when the, the Supreme Court starts paying attention in, in 1952, and then finally in 1965, we get the last case of the Supreme Court. But there's never a moment when the Supreme Court justices ride in on the big white horse and smite the censors and say, this is unconstitutional, you can't do it. Never happened. Hmm. The Supreme Court never declared state censorship of movies unconstitutional. I wanna talk with you, Laura, about cancel culture because there's a lot of news out there today that's making reports about people taking down and tearing down monuments to figures that were very controversial in history. If they had connections, say, to big issues like slavery or genocide, even, even you know, reports about college professors, university professors who are having their jobs compromised or even possibly being fired because they have views that are unpopular on the college campus. I'm wondering, what do you think of this, this term cancel culture and, and do you think that we could apply that term to what we've seen in the past, especially with the film industry and, and films being censored by New York State? That is an extraordinarily good question. That is a really tough question. The term cancel culture, of course, means different things to different people. It's not the kind of thing that anyone's ever gonna define and we're all gonna agree on it. But I think we have a pretty good idea of what, what we mean when we say that. In the 1970s and 1980s, we had the same kind of things and we would have called it the culture wars. 
That was the term that was used then. And it's interesting, it's mostly religious groups. If you look at the people who have argued against movies as art, it's usually religious, religiously based problems. Right. And so in the 1970s and the 1980s, we get lots of uh, pressure groups demanding that one movie or another, you know, be not be shown. Now there's no legal way to stop it anymore. They, they want to bring the pressure. And I think the cancel culture today is a lot like that in terms of public pressure. We can't force you to stop, but we're going to make life miserable for you until you do. I think that's what, what's going on here. Is it mostly religious groups that you still see engaging in this cancel culture no, today, or do you see other kinds of groups and other kinds of ideological factions doing this? Yeah, and I think that's where it's a little different, because now I think it's become it's more political. I see a lot more political that's going on here. This is, this is quite different. The movie censorship culture that I write about and talk about was not really political. Very rarely was it a political issue. And the censors were very reluctant to touch a movie that had a political message. They usually stayed away from that kind of thing and let it go. Now, when I think you see things, and uh, I think you're, you're thinking about the Confederate statues, you know, that kind of yeah. thing. Um, I see that as quite different mm -hmm. because I see those statues as not so much works of art. And I'm sorry to the person who created the statue because to that person <laughs> clearly it's a work of art. But I see those statues more as political statements. Okay. If you look at when those statues, particularly the Confederate statues, when those statues went up, it wasn't right after the Civil War mm -hmm. when you would expect them to go up to commemorate the people who led the Confederate forces. When those statues went up, the majority, there were two big peaks. One was around between 1900 and 1910, so the beginnings of the modern civil rights movement, the uh, beginning of the, the NAACP as an organization, huge, massive amounts of immigration in American cities, and many white Protestant Americans are worried about that immigration. That's when we see a whole bunch of those statues go up. The second big peak we see is in the 1950s. I think the, the Montgomery bus boycott, Rosa Parks, the Brown versus Board of Education, the 1957 Little Rock uh, Central High School desegregation. That's when a lot of those statues went up. So scholars who study the lost cause and study Southern culture are very likely to say those statues were more political statements of warning. Mm -hmm. to African-Americans. Right, so, so it's the context different. in which these types of things, like the sculptures or the statues were made, that really helps us to flesh out the story of why is this controversial? Why are some people saying that these should be taken down? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm kind of wondering though, because there are some things that have become controversial that were not necessarily intended as political statements. Like for mm -hmm. instance, you think of the films of Roman Polanski or Woody Allen, mm -hmm. they make these, these fantastic films with great cinematography and storytelling, but some people have boycotted their films because of the things that the creators have done in their past, like such as, as child sexual abuse or rape. I'm wondering, you know, is there ever a point at which we should or can separate the art from the artist? Is there ever a point at which we should really draw the line and be like, no, you know what, I'm not gonna support this, I'm not gonna watch this or consume this because the creator did something really unethical or really wrong? That's really a great question too. And you mentioned Woody Allen and Roman Polanski and I can take it back even further. You know, if you go back to 1922, Hollywood, it was immersed in scandals, three huge scandals at the same time. One of them, Fatty Arbuckle, who was immensely popular comedian, but also an immense man. And he was charged with either raping or having sex with a young woman who later died because he had had sex with her. And it's huge and uh, uh, controversy over that. That's when Hollywood actually started its self-censorship, was over that, to, to quiet that down, to make things go away. Now, whether you should separate the art from the artist, that, because we don't have governmental censorship anymore, that's a personal decision. Right. But the personal decision, and that's fine, e each person makes that personal decision, but when a group goes out and says, you shouldn't ever watch a Woody Allen movie, or you should never watch a Roman Polanski movie, and we're gonna put some kind of, of you know, uh, uh, pressure on you to do that, then that, I think, is a very different situation.
Yeah. Well, it sounds to me, Laura, like all of these different historical moments can still serve as kind of warnings and tales for us today. Um, your book and your research sound fantastic, and it was such a pleasure speaking with you on A House for Arts. Well, thank you. I was delighted to be here.